struggling with sleep? Dr. Cole is here to help. Whether you need a comprehensive sleeping coach program, suspect you have sleep apnea, or simply seek a second opinion, she's available for consultations in New Jersey, New York, California, and Georgia, with more states coming soon. Schedule your free 15-minute consultation today to find out which visit is right for you at asktosleepmd.com and start your journey to better sleep with a trusted physician. Hi, I'm Dr. Allison Cole, sleep medicine specialist and bona fide chronic insomniac. Welcome to the Sleep is My Waking Passion podcast. Remember, knowledge is empowerment, and if applied correctly, it can help you biohack your way to a better night of sleep just like I did. Welcome everyone to the Sleep is My Waking Passion podcast. You know who I am. I am your host, uh, Allison Cole, and I am joined here today with Dr. Indira Gurbagavatulu. Um, for short, we call her Dr. G. And there is, um, Indira, I just got to say the backstory because this is just his, hilarious. I had no idea. So I have one person in my life who was Dr. G for me here in New Jersey and Indira is based, she works um, at University of Pennsylvania, and she holds a uh, a lot of hats. One is being the fellowship director over at UPenn. Um, she has also done a lot of advocacy work, and we're going to be talking about school start times today. The backstory basically is that uh, Indira has a sister, Sarada, and I have been very fond of Sarah, Sarada for many, many years. She's helped me a lot with my lung cancer patients. She is a, a lung cancer specialist and oncologist in my neck of the woods. And through my conversation, we were talking about how I only knew one other Dr. G, and now I have two Dr. Gs in my life. So welcome, Indira. <laughs> Thank, um, you. Thank you so much for your time. You've done a lot of work regionally in this arena, and you have a lot of experience not only as a sleep specialist, you're a pulmonologist just like myself. Um, you also uh, have kids, right? So you have a college-age student that you were te just telling me you were not able to have see change. However, with your work in your region, with your expertise, your high school student may actually see this come to fruition, a change in school start time. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it's really exciting. It, it really takes a village and um, it's, it's many, many parents working together and showing up, being resilient and, and despite um, you know, setbacks year after year after year. Um, they've continued to show up and uh, our district, yes, they've promised to make change starting in fall of 2024. Yay! So it's really this has exciting. been, um, <laughs> what you're telling me now is my kids are not even near high school age and that I'm going to have to start poking the bear a little bit and seeing if we can get this off the ground. In truth be told, there have been some folks here in the local area who are also really grassrootsing it and, and trying to uh, spread the word on the importance of addressing school tar start times, which, you know, essentially is what we're going to talk about. Just to start, to give people a quick review, for kids, can you tell us kind of what is a normal amount of sleep we should be aiming for, for um, school-age kids and teenagers? Can you um, share with the audience that information? Yeah, so teens, age 13 to 18, the National Sleep Foundation has set forward um, – uh, recommended amounts of start times uh, or sleep times. And for teenagers, it's eight to 10 hours. Um, so a bare minimum of eight for more, most kids and some children need up to 10 hours a night of sleep. Um, younger children in elementary school through middle school, nine to 12 hours. Um, and even younger children, preschoolers, 10 to 13 hours. Um, and some of them may need a nap still. Um, Babies spend more than half the day sleeping, 12 to 16 hours, and by the time they're toddlers, it drops a little bit, 11 to 14 hours. So our sleep need basically declines gradually as we get older, and then it kind of stabilizes in adulthood, so like seven to nine hours a day for an adult. But clearly, when we're thinking as adults who are parents of kids, we really just got to keep in mind, kids need sleep. And um, unfortunately, with how their sleep cycle may change with time, they don't always get it, particularly um, as they get to be their teenage years. Can you just describe a little bit for our listeners that delayed sleep phase, as we like to say in our sleep medical parlance, and, yeah. um, and why that factors into school start times? Yeah, you've, you've pointed to a really major um, point that I don't want <clears throat> to 
<clears throat> step over, which is that our children are not getting the sleep that they need. The Centers for Disease Control has done nationwide surveys year after year. And, and um, back in 2013, about a third of high school students were getting the recommended bare minimum of eight hours a night. Um, and then a subsequent survey in 2017, only 25% were. And the kids that are not getting, uh, that are getting even less sleep, um, girls were getting less um, than, than 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 boys, um, black and Hispanic children were getting less than white children. And then as they go through high school from ninth to 10th, to 11th to 12th, the amount of the proportion of children getting at least eight hours drops off precipitously. So they're just not getting it. And there are a number of reasons for this, but a major driver is actually biology um, that um, once children at uh, reach puberty, the preferred time to go to sleep delays by an hour and a half to two hours. So you can put your school age child down, you know, a six year old at eight or 8.30 and they will fall right asleep. But if you take a teenager after puberty and have them go to try to go to sleep at 8 or 8.30, they're gonna lie in bed, tossing, turning and staring at the clock. They're just not gonna be able to do it till sometime after 10.30, 11 midnight. Um, so if you have that strong biological driver, plus you have a very early start time, usually high schoolers are the ones that have to get up and catch that, you know, early morning bus at 630, 650. Um, so you're cutting it off at both ends. The opportunity to sleep becomes restricted because you have a late uh, preferred bedtime and also a late preferred rise time, but you're forcing them to get up with that alarm clock to make it to school on time. So chronically they end up sleep deprived. This is huge. So just to reiterate, guys, literally, if you're going, okay, this sounds like a lot of statistics, blah, blah, blah. The bottom line is it's somewhere between 70 to 80% of our teenagers, the majority, the vast majority, they are not sleeping sufficiently for their age. It's yeah. literally most high schoolers. This is not a good situation here. So, and it's, as high as sometimes close to 40% in some of our kids that are not, haven't even hit puberty, that they're even sleep deprived. So it's a, a really, really pervasive issue. And it tends to disadvantage, you know, folks that are of lower socioeconomic status, potentially um, more quote unquote minorities. And what I found interesting as well is it seemed as though the worst case scenario seemed to be, like you said, the 11th to 12th graders, and not only that, actually, um, once you start getting to that age group, um, you being of South Asian descent, me being, you know, from uh, my mom being from South Korea, we, you have the Asians actually that start to prevail a bit where they really start to have some issues. It almost, um, you know, kind of reminds me, and again, I don't have any data on this, but it it kind of reminds me of a little bit of my mom being a little bit of a tiger mom back in the day. And I'm like, oh my God, I wonder if there's some pressure for like college and you're really going forth. And I wonder if that's, one of the driving factors that we see in the spike with Asians. I, I know that there's no data to support that, but it's just a, a random theory of mine having come from a very uh, strict upbringing <laughs> and, I think and really Allison, being a gunner when it came to college. I mean, across the board, what children are expected to do now and how much they're expected to learn has changed a lot since when we were kids. That's true. Um, and they just have so many other competing pressures and, um, you know, the, the social media and the the pressures to stay connected and to manage their social media presence. And in addition, all of their usual social relationships, plus all of the schoolwork, I feel like it's gotten a lot harder, the amount of homework, the AP classes, um, you know, and, and obviously it changes district to district, but... I think in general, the pressures they're facing might have escalated from from even 10 years ago. So um, that is such a good point. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and unfortunately, mean, there's a myth around sleep at all ages. Right. We have mm. plenty of adults who, you know, have this machismo that if you don't sleep, that somehow means that you're tough and you're, you know, you can brave it or that you, quote unquote, get used to it. And and these myths are extremely prevalent, even in um, in our teen populations where, uh, they, there's this belief that they just get used to it. My body just gets to you. Then that's just not true. Um, the brain keeps score, the body keeps score. And instead of getting used to it, what actually happens is you accumulate something called sleep debt. So the more sleep you go without, the more you, you owe back to your body and to your brain. Um, and, and the way a lot of these kids try to make it up is on days off or on weekends, um, they try to sleep in. And in fact, that that actually has a name. If you sleep at least two hours or more on a weekend compared to a school day, 
uh, that two hour difference, it, that condition is called social jet lag. And it's just like if you were to fly from New York to Paris, the, the way your body feels when you're jet lagged. It's a miserable experience and it's been, lots of studies have shown that it's associated with pretty poor health outcomes um, over the long run. So it, it, catching up on weekends is not a way to manage health and manage sleep health. We need to get regular sufficient amounts of sleep every day. And I also remember talking to uh, Funke Afalabi Brown, who used to be at UPenn, um, and she was mentioning as well that kids also, as they start to be teenagers, tend to be more resistant to even that feeling of the accumulation of sleep debt. So they don't sense it the same way an adult would, like, I've really been up for a long time. So they almost, it's like you have the delayed sleep phase, but also this almost like decreased sensitivity to that sense of needing to sleep. Yeah, it's the, it's the ability to resist sleep increase it, 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 you're, you're able to put off, um, and delay sleep onset longer because you're able to tolerate wakefulness for longer periods into the evening. And, you know, we don't know the exact reason why that happens, but it probably has an evolutionary benefit that if you can stay awake longer, then you can partake in either defense or gathering food or protecting your um, the group that you're with. Um, it probably has, um, you know, evolutionary advantage for survival. Um, but, uh, but yes, that, that happens. And then the, there's a third thing that happens with sleep biology, which is that our day-night rhythm actually in- lengthens just a little bit to just above 24 hours. So when your circadian cycle is a little longer than 24 hours, then it's easier to delay sleep um, at night. So it's a number of things. It's the, it's the later preferred bedtime, the ability to resist sleep, and the fact that, that our 24-hour cycle is actually lengthens just a bit. Um, that all add up to uh, make it just impossible. This, there's no um, individual level, quote unquote, fix for this problem. If you want to get more sleep, um, you have the biology, you have the early start times, and then you have the behaviors too, right? So kids going on social media and, um, you know, the, the jobs, the after school activities, the homework, the friends. Um, so all of those things are competing for sleep, um, for a child's time for sleep. So when you look at where can you make a difference, you really can't change biology. Um, kids have tried that. They've tried going to bed on time and it just doesn't work. Um, so you can look at homework and uh, being on screens, but really this problem existed long before homework and screens. It's, it's, and, and you can look there, but um, what this demands is actually a systemic solution because it is a systemic problem. The, the percentage of, uh, that you mentioned, you know, 75% of kids not getting what they need in terms of, you know, the, the minimum sleep, the bare minimum, right? We're not even talking about what the preferred amount, we're talking about bare minimum. Um, so if you want to make the biggest difference for the largest number of people all at once, the way to do it is to address school start times. And we have it backward. We have elementary school kids going last, and we have high school kids going first. Um, and it turns out that when these schedules were set back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, they were not thinking about circadian science. We just didn't have all the information we needed when these buses, the bus schedules were made. Um, so, so we now have the information and it's our duty to respond to the information we have so that our children can benefit from all the scientific knowledge. And what that knowledge is telling us is that high school students need to start later and, um, you know, in order to get the sleep they need. Well, that's a really, really key point here is that you're emphasizing, which when I was putting together this, um, you know, this discussion, I hadn't really thought about, which is the fact that it's not so simple to just simply make recommendations to parents. Um, oh, you do X, Y, or Z, and this sort of quote unquote fixes the problem. Truly, as you mentioned, it is systemic. It's a systemic issue, and it needs to be tackled as such. And perhaps the better part of our utility or our energy um, is to join forces as parents and talk to folks like you who are experts in this area and really go to the Board of Education and really advocate for that change to happen because the science backs it up. Out of curiosity, are there any arguments that you've come across with your advocacy work um, 
against the change in school start times um, if there were some common threads, some common uh, sort of reasons why people used to justify not changing it other than, well, it's just inconvenient to switch around the, you know, the bus times. Um, are, and, and are those concerns really truly valid in terms of what the data shows? Yeah. So um, these are challenges. The buses, it's, I don't want to step over any of this. It's not a small challenge for some districts. And we mm-hmm. have a a real shortage of qualified bus drivers right now. So that just adds another layer of complexity to the problem. Um, But interestingly, when districts have looked at it and said, hey, is there a way for us to make our routes more efficient? Because they haven't looked at these routes in a long, long, long time. And when you think of something like, well, let's change these these start times, you know, you have a limited pool of buses. And one way that people decided we could save money is that the same pool shuttles the kids in in turn. So, you you know, the elementary schools go last, the middle schools usually in the middle, and then the high schools first, because nobody wants little six-year-olds standing in the dark, you know, waiting for a bus at 6 a.m. So, um, but, but the districts that have done it have, have been very creative with their solutions, and they've figured out ways to reroute their buses to make it work. Um, and there are studies that should, the RAND Corporation released a, um, a really important study with Wendy Troxell as one of the investigators um, that showed that over time, communities that invest the extra funds into buses make that money back eventually. Um, and, and it becomes cost neutral because you end up saving a lot of money in um in car crashes. You know, when you don't do this, you, you mentioned wow. 11th and 12th graders. They're also the ones that are learning mm-hmm. to drive. When you look at the data on which age group is at the highest risk of a fall asleep accident, it's those it's those kids. And so and the crashes tend to be extremely expensive and they're much more likely to be fatal or cause uh, property damage or, or uh, physical harm because when you get in an accident, you know, you steer away, you break, you know, you do everything you can to prevent the accident. But if you are tired or sleepy or have actually fallen asleep, you're not going to do those things. So these tend to be very high impact crashes. So they end up being very expensive. So that's one way that you're already paying if you don't do anything. And the other way is that fewer kids graduate. If they're not sleeping, they're not performing well on tests. They're not doing well at school. They're not showing up. They're late. They're absent. Um, They're calling out sick. So you get actually higher graduation rates so be- and, and command higher salaries down the road. So between salaries and saved accidents, the money comes back to you. So people have worked out the busing. Um, in terms of what are the logistical challenges, buses is one that's often cited, but also um, games after school, um, you know, uh, competition, sports. Um, a lot of kids are involved in this. It's very, very important to them. It's nice for them to be active mm-hmm. in a physical activity. Um, but if one school changes, then they'll be out of sync with other schools. So it makes right. it hard. Like districts need to move together um, with their the, the teams that they compete with. So um, there's some coordination required. But if a big school district does do it, it also provides a major incentive for the others to also change so that they can continue to compete in sports. So that can actually work for you as well. Um, but yeah, those are the things. And, and, and obviously, the, the, uh, sometimes they use the older children end up serving as child care for um, younger siblings. So if you delay their times and the younger kids come home first and parents worry about, well, how will I have child care then for my younger children? Um, but, you know, even that, these are all logistical challenges. They're not obstacles. They're just challenges to be worked through. And they all have solutions because if, if it isn't after school care, then you're looking at before school care, which is actually even harder to find when, um, you know, you have elementary school kids that can't go to school till 9 or 930 and, and parents can't hang around because their jobs start early. So you're looking at care then, too. So, you know, this all requires creative, out of the box thinking and a solution oriented mindset. The key is to commit to the change and then the solutions follow after that. It's not to use each of these as an excuse not to do it because we're already paying a very high price. Yes. Speaking of the high price, can you elaborate a little bit about um, what we know about chronic sleep deprivation, particularly in these kids and how it might negatively impact um, their school performance, for example, or even their, uh, I've heard, um, exercise performance, like how they do in sports, which, you know, it's such an important part of what they do, but they're not going to function as well if they're, yeah. you know, not getting that sufficient sleep. 
Yeah. When you think about sleep, your whole body needs sleep, you know, and, and it needs sleep because sleep, it, not getting sleep impacts literally every domain of um, a student's uh, performance. So the first and foremost, the reason they're in school is for academics. So the early start times have been linked to lower grades, lower test scores, SAT scores, engagement in class. Um, there's more sleepiness, falling asleep, tardiness, absenteeism. And in fact, there's the because of this delayed sleep phase that you're asking them to get up, go to school and sit down and take a calculus test during the sleepiest part of their day. So it's, it's, it would be what 4 a.m., 5 a.m. is for you and me. Right. So as adults, so we're asking mm -hmm. people to go to work and sit down and, and, and learn. And in fact, that, that morning period is just such a miserable time for them because they're in the deepest, lowest part of their circadian rhythm um, that it's actually called first period effect. So academics get uh, impacted, mental health, physical health, personal safety, public safety. Um, we have an epidemic of depression, anxiety, suicidality in this age group. And uh, lack of sleep is a big driver of mental health problems, um, substance abuse, um, even, even um, medicating excessively with caffeine just to power through the day, um, risky behaviors, um, you know, sexual indiscretion, um, alcohol use, bullying, even being a victim of bullying has been associated with uh, early start times. Um, you know, because wow. socially, I mean, they're expected to you know, read social cues and, and nonverbal communication and, and engage with others. And all of those skills get dulled, those, all of those cognitive skills um, without sufficient sleep. So it's easier to make a misstep. It's easier to be aggressive. It's easier to be, um, you know, say or do something that you shouldn't have said or done to, to upset someone. Physical health, more nurse visits, um, headaches, stomach ailments. Um, and over time, what happens without sleep is that the hormones that regulate appetite and um, hunger become inverted so that they're hungry all the time, they're eating the wrong kinds of foods, and you see obesity, um, and then just metabolic health overall long term. So um, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, these have all been linked with chronic sleep deprivation. Um, and we are seeing higher rates of obesity in, in younger kids now. Um, and then I mentioned safety, so driving habits and accidents. Um, safety in sports, more likely to get injured and not perform to their um, uh, optimal skill level. Uh, so literally every domain of their performance is affected by not getting enough sleep because of these wow. early start times. Did you, out of curiosity, this is kind of an aside, I could see, say for, to my, for myself personally, I mean, I really had that philosophy and I think, you know, I had this um, abnormal personal mindset through high school, through undergrad, through med school, through residency, I'm like, well, I have trouble sleeping anyway. You know, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Forget about it. And I lived for many, many years kind of chronically sleep deprived. It, I cannot even tell you how much I could have used this information 20 plus years ago and really respected it um, as someone who knows so much about this. Was that ever an issue for you? Were you always a good sleeper? I'm just curious. Well, I did a residency in a fellowship <laughs> in critical care pulmonary. So there have been plenty <laughs> nights where I didn't get sleep, um, medical school, college. I don't think I ever pulled an all-nighter because I, I knew that I, I – I, I had to get sleep. I, I, I'm not one of these people that can pull an all-nighter and then do great the next day. I, I learned early that I need my sleep. But, um, you know, it, it is hard, um, you know, in an internship residency. And, and I did it during the era of no duty hour regulations. So, um, <laughs> uh, me too. Yeah. We're old ladies. Old school. <laughs> You remember being on rounds, at, you know, or pre-rounding at five in the morning or six in the morning and um, you're on your feet and, and completely exhausted. And it is, it is very, very hard. Um, so I think that, um, you know, sleep deprivation is actually used as a form of torture. You have to realize, right? So <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're designed for sleep and we need our sleep. I need my sleep. So... Now, one of the things that's been out there is that the ideal time for these kids to go to school, if you had to pick an ideal time, seems to be around 830 in the morning would be the ideal start time. At least that's what I've read. 
Um, I was just curious if there was a particular data points or is that mostly related to, okay, if you're slightly delayed and you're going to be more tired closer to like 11 ish or so that would kind of at least try to maximize some of your sleep. I'm just wondering where there's any literature behind. Yeah. That so from. the 830 recommendation comes from a 2014 paper. It's a, the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, recommendation, uh, that was authored by Judith Owens. Um, and they looked at um, a number of studies that had already been done at that point, and they saw the inflection happen at 8.30. It doesn't mean 8.30 is the best. It actually, a lot of kids would do even better if it was 9.30 or even 10. Um, but, you know, it has to be feasible. So it's a balance between mm -hmm. um, um, biological acceptability and logistical feasibility. So um, I, they came up with that. And... Um, you know, it's it's a start and it's an important start. It doesn't guarantee that all children will get eight to 10 hours. It's just that a, a few more of them will. And we still need to do these other things, right? So like managing homework and workloads and um, sleep literacy, sleep health literacy, and making sure, you know, just like you and I went through all of our training, not really knowing much about sleep. We got very, very little education about sleep in medical school, and yet we th spend a third of our lives doing this. So I think it's really important that we that we um, educate everyone about its importance, so that um, you know people make it a priority, and that families build a culture of valuing sleep, and that parents role model healthy sleep habits to their kids. Um, and that that just becomes a foundational pattern of behavior. Um, and then just over months and months and years and years that, that we can then perhaps um, make a dent in some of the things that we're seeing in our society. Everything from obesity and physical health effects to mental health and, and accidents. Awesome. I wanted to finish up this conversation with just reemphasizing, you know, one of the questions I had for you is what can parents do to maximize sleep for their, for their kids and teens? And one of the things that you had specifically mentioned to me that's really important is this is a not about you're a bad parent because you don't do blank. This is about the fact that it is a systemic issue. That's the bigger picture. That's the biggest emphasis so I guess my question to you in readjusting that question is, are there, th uh, are there ways that you would suggest parents get involved on a systemic level? And also, too, are there some simple things that will not fix it, but maybe things that they can encourage uh, their kids to do? Um, for example, the modeling of a good sleep habit and good behavior. Yeah. Um, so that's... Understanding that it's not going to fix the situation. Yeah. So it is. It is a big task. Um, and it is an important task. It's one that we absolutely must do. So the first thing is to, for the advocating for the systemic solution, get involved with your school board and start a dialogue. Send letters, show up at board meetings and start a question. If you have a school that's for high schoolers that starts before 830, which the vast majority of us do, um, then start asking. This is the science. Get the 2014 uh, paper, the American Academy of Pediatrics paper. There have been dozens of societies since then that have endorsed that paper and say, why aren't we doing this? And, and hold your leadership accountable for, you know, they're there to serve your children, our children. Um, so it's important for us to to make the ask um, and then um, and then keep showing up and keep educating, connect with your local sleep health professionals, have them come and give um, lectures, talks to parents and and students and teachers and coaches and bus drivers and principals. And really, we need everybody on deck. Um, so so and the advocacy work can be slow, it can be long, it can be exhausting and it can be discouraging at times, or it could be really simple. There are districts that I've spoken to where they said, hey, can you tell us about sleep? And then very soon after, they're like, OK, let's do it. And then next thing you know, they've they've made the change. So it, it really is very, very dependent and uh, on which district you're in, what kind of resources you have and how big is the change. So. Um, so don't give up and get started and get going because it could take a long time. And then the other piece is at home. What can you do at home? Um, you know, obviously modeling um, good habits. So, so 
caffeine intake and what you eat and getting plenty of exercise and having a very regular bedtime and wake up time and, and respecting those times. Right. So those are all really important. And then one of the things that that gets a lot of attention is screen time for teenagers. And one approach that a lot of families take is, OK, I'm taking it away. And that may work or it may not work um, because kids have an uncanny way of getting to things that they want. Um, so, <laughs> so if if it's if that screen is a solution for your child, it's really important to dialogue with your child about what is this purpose that the screen is serving? Is it is it social connection? Is it um, is it de-stressing? Is it a solution to depression or anxiety? Um, and 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 address those things in a healthy way. If the child is using the screen as a way to cope with something that's that that that's gotten too big, then it's important to address those things instead of just taking the screen away. So it's really important to address the reason why. Um, and then, you know, keep the bedroom cool and dark and comfortable and um, and, uh, and and make sure that there's enough time that in bed, that they're getting in bed as soon as they can. Uh, they're efficient with their other activities. Um, and then, um, you know, as I said, work with the districts. Interestingly, um, when we talk about homework workload and how long it takes for children to get through their homework, mm -hmm. the studies have shown that the districts that do delay start times and the kids end up getting, the myth is that, oh, they'll just go to bed even later then. And it turns out, yes, they do go to bed a little later, but the extra time in the morning, they do sleep in more. You just have a schedule that's better aligned with their physiology. So they do, they, later start times do result in longer sleep. And so it turns out the kids that are getting longer sleep are more efficient with their homework. So they're able to get to bed earlier um, and, and, uh, and get the sleep they need. So the lo remember this phrase when we were in residency, the longer you stay, the longer you stay, the longer you're awake, the longer you're awake. Oh my goodness, so you, yes. You end up taking longer to get things done if you're not getting the sleep you need. So it, it's once you start that loop, it's, it just gets harder to catch up. So yeah, it felt like if if you couldn't get everything done by a certain time, then you're like, uh oh, if I gotta stay here till three, like how are these notes gonna get done? Oh my yeah. god, I'm so tired. Yeah, and I, then oh, you just I drag, and everything takes even longer, yeah. and then you're there, so more people come and ask you questions, so it adds to, adds to your workload. So, so yeah, it's it's important for a number of reasons. You know, there's another piece of physiology that's really interesting, um, which is that light. Right. So we say turn off your electronics because it's the blue light that serves as a, you know, it, it tricks your brain into thinking the sun is out. So your brain then stops making melatonin and then it waits for the dim light to make melatonin, which is the hormone of darkness. And it signals the brain that it's time to sleep. Um, so it's really interesting, but our brains react to light uh, in a very complex way. It's not just light is on, so I'm not asleep and light is off, so I'm asleep. It's actually, there's a there's what's called a phase response curve to light. So depending on when your brain sees light can have uh, paradoxical, un undesirable effects. Um, so the way we have it set up for these kids, by the time they go to sleep, it's late in the night and then we're asking them to get up at a very early hour in the morning. And so they're, they're up, they're turning on lights, they're going outside and they're getting exposed to light at an hour of the day where it actually perpetuates the phase delay. So if you give light, if you let somebody finish out their full sleep and then expose them to morning light, it helps them get to bed on time the next day. But if you give that light too early, which is what's happening in a lot of these districts, it makes it even harder to go to sleep the next night. So we're actually making oh, that. Oh, that's right. We're actually yeah, making so the. You're sort of you're further phase delaying them, even though you don't mean to, because exactly. they're getting insufficient sleep. Wow. Yeah. So okay. if the light is, is, is um, if you're exposed to light too early in the morning, then you'll have an even harder time going to bed, at, uh, falling asleep at night. So a, a situation where they're already struggling, you're just basically locking it in place, making it impossible to, to go to fall asleep earlier, um, which is another reason why we really need to delay these start times. Out of curiosity, is there any literature on taking a low dose of melatonin like you would to try to phase shift someone in these high school students so um, if you're in at districts a, where they haven't made that change? Um, yeah, that's a great question. It's um, 
If you're at the point where you're looking at melatonin, it's probably a good idea to talk to a sleep specialist because just like a phase response curve, there's also a melatonin response curve. So if you take melatonin at the wrong time, it can again have a paradoxical effect, an undesirable effect that you don't want. Um, and melatonin is not a drug. It's, it's not a drug in the same way as other drugs. It's actually considered a hormone. It is not, F doesn't go through FDA approval. So nobody is regulating to see how much there is um, from pill to pill, tablet to tablet, um, bottle to bottle. And it can vary up to fivefold, people have found, the amount that compared to what's supposed to be uh, in the pill um, based on the label. So you don't actually know how much you're getting when you take it. Um, you don't know what else is in there, what other vehicles have been combined with the melatonin because nobody's checking. It's not FDA approved. So um, there is a role for melatonin in certain certain sets of children, um, people with specific sleep disorders, people with de developmental delays, certain um, um, you know certain diagnostic uh, conditions. Um, but if if it's if if those are the groups you're talking about, it needs to be done under the supervision of a qualified uh, physician. But um, otherwise, we don't recommend people just sort of you know popping a melatonin to to cope with an unhealthy start time. That is such a time. good point, and thank you for that. Yeah, and it's it's funny because those I've looked at those studies where they've looked at like over 20 supplements, and I'm like, guys, give me a list of the ones that really kind of didn't have what they had. Like, they don't give that to you in the publication. I'm like, please share it. I want to know which ones are not so good. So you're sort of left going, okay, well, in general, you know, you you want to be careful with them, but it's a global recommendation and not too, too specific to uh, certain formulations which, um, man, it would be certainly helpful if we had a, a secret uh, list of the secret sauce where we could say, okay, this is good or this is not good. I'm sure there's lots of implications for why people don't specify or call out certain brands. But Yeah, the, um, the, the important thing to know, though, is that the problem of, of sleep really grew exponentially during the pandemic because the amount, the amount, number of calls to poison control centers because of melatonin overdose mm -hmm. really skyrocketed during the pandemic. So um, too many people um, are thinking that melatonin is the solution. They have it in their homes um, and it's falling into the hands of, of vulnerable children. So um, it is, it, it needs to be respected as, um, as a, a drug that could potentially do harm. So in conclusion, guys, if, if you start to get involved, um, go to the Board of Ed. Hopefully we've convinced you that there's actual science behind this and that this is better for your teens. And we want to give our most vulnerable people, our most vulnerable population, that ability to have the best opportunities academically, the best opportunities in terms of sports activities, um, you know, we want them to develop and make good choices. And it kind of starts with us, not only systemic, but also our behaviors and modeling those healthy behaviors for our kids, which is really hard to do. I don't know about you, but you know, I've got to be like, all right, no looking at this phone. You know, I got to be a good example to them, a good steward, trying to teach them good habits. My kids are um, littler than you, but it's a challenge. Yeah. But you know what? You're not alone and you don't have to invent the wheel yourself. There are so many wonderful resources. I'm gonna. I would point everyone to Start School Later, which is a national organization. They have amazing resources on their website, um, and including links to uh, important documents, things you can use to take to your school board. Find out when the next meeting is. Show up and and you know present this information. So Start School Later can be helpful. Um, sleepeducation.org is another uh, website I would refer people to who want to learn more about sleep, about melatonin, about sleep hygiene. Um, and the Minnesota Toolkit is another one. The state of Minnesota has a wonderful um, website filled with resources for people who want to address school start times. Thank you, Indira. This was such a fun conversation. I've learned so much. And now what you're telling me is I got to go to the next school board meeting. I got to make the time because <laughs> it's got to start now. It might take a decade. Maybe my kids will uh, see the light of a later start time when they, they get to be that age yeah. from your experience. You know, one other thing I want to say, the school, the fact that this is a systemic solution has been recognized. Um, so that's the state of California and the state of Florida now have state level requirements that schools, um, you know, that high schools start later. Um, and several other states are actually looking at this as well. 
So um, it is a really important issue and it needs to be addressed at a, you know, at a high level. Thank you. This was so much fun. Guys, listen to her. She's amazing. And I hope to talk to you soon about another topic because it's just so much fun to, ch to chat with you. I really feel like I'm elevating my game when I have conversations with you. So I appreciate you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for having me. If you are enjoying this podcast, if you feel that you are growing, you're more knowledgeable, you're feeling empowered about your sleep, that is the purpose. So please, please take the time to like and review the podcast, share it amongst your friends and family. Please follow me. If you'd like to follow me on Instagram or Facebook, I am there as well. My handle on Instagram and TikTok is AskTheSleepMD. And you can also go to my website, AskTheSleepMD.com for more information about each of these episodes. We will be sharing with you cited articles that you can actually refer to and read yourself if you like and lots of juicy tidbits about how to sleep better. Thank you. This podcast would not be possible without the support of Mr. Joey Salvia, who is my producer, and Adrian Petarath, my creative director. Disclaimer. The statements made on this podcast have not been evaluated by the U.S. Food or Drug Administration. They are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. The information provided by this podcast should not be used as individual medical advice. While I am a practicing sleep provider, I am not your sleep provider. You should always consult with your personal healthcare provider for individual recommendations and treatment.